Good morning, everybody. We'll go ahead and get started today. Abba, Father, in Christ's name, in your Holy Spirit, we do thank you for this day. And Holy Spirit, we do ask that you be our rabbi. We know that you're here. You're so faithful to bring us the word of the Lord, to teach it to us, help us grasp, understand, and live it. And we thank you for all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, if you've already looked at the board, then you know uh, what feast we're in this week. It's been uh, a week-long celebration on Monday evening, and it goes through this next Monday evening. It's seven days. It's the Feast of Tabernacles. And we've touched on this before. I try to do my best to at least acknowledge uh, the feasts and festivals as they come along each year. But in praying about it, the Lord really put a special emphasis on tabernacles. Now, again, I'm not uh, a prophet, so I'm not here to say this or that's going to happen. But uh, I do know for a fact that he really wanted this emphasized today. So I want to be faithful in that. And we'll just get into it. Well, this is the ultimate feast. And, you know, you remember that in Leviticus 23, Abba instituted uh, his feasts and festivals. And they are the feasts and festivals of the Lord. Uh, not simply the Jews. John calls them in his reference in John's gospel, Feast of the Jews, but he's just trying to give them context because he's writing to the Gentile audience largely. But Sukkot, Tabernacles, or Feast of Booths, any one of those three, you'll hear it called uh, those. It's all the same. It's the most significant of the Feast of the Lord. It's the seventh feast that God ordained, and you know that seven means completion in Scripture. The spring feast or Pesach, which is Passover, called both unleavened bread, first fruits. Interestingly, unleavened bread is a week long celebration. Passover begins and first fruits falls within it. So Jesus was crucified on Passover. He was resurrected on first fruits. And then Shavuot weeks or Pentecost, all the same, uh, 50 days later, is when Holy Spirit was poured out. So the spring feasts and festivals have already been fulfilled in Christ. The fall feasts and festivals have to do with his second coming. And so there is still a fulfillment yet to be regarding those. But Rosh Hashanah trumpets, the same thing, Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement. And now we're in the seventh feast season of the Lord, or feast week. And it's Sukkot, booze, or tabernacles. It's called any of those three. Tabernacles gives all the other feasts and festivals their meaning and fulfillment because it points to the outcome and provision of God's presence through his dwelling and restored intimacy with and among his people in his son, the Holy Spirit forever. So tabernacles, what we're in now, booze, Sukkot, which means booze in Hebrew, that is the one that fulfills all of the other six. This gives Passover its meaning. Christ is crucified. Why? So that he could pay for our sins. Why? So that we could have our sins removed. Why? So that we could be in the presence of God. The same thing with his resurrection. He lives that we might live in him. Holy Spirit came and was poured out upon us. Why? So that we would be empowered to live with the Lord and live in him and live like Christ. Rosh Hashanah trumpets is announcing something great. What? Well, it's the return of Christ. Day of Atonement has to do with the goat nature. It's the continued sanctification of God's people. Sheep are not involved on Day of Atonement. Goats are. So Christ is the perfect Lamb of God. He already died. He justified us before God. But we're still in a sanctification process until we're perfected. And that's what Yom Kippur is about. And then you have Sukkot, Booze, Tabernacles. And this is what it's all about. This is why Christ came. It's the ultimate feast. It's a celebration in Leviticus 23, 33, 34, and also 39 through 40. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel saying on the 15th day of this seventh month and for seven days is the feast of booze to the Lord. And you've gathered in the produce of the land. You shall celebrate the feast of the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a solemn rest. And on the eighth day shall be a solemn rest. And you shall take on the first day the fruit of the splendid trees, branches of palm trees, boughs of leafy trees, willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. So tabernacles is the most joyous, the most fun celebration of them all. It, it is all about celebrating the Lord 
enjoying one another. It's about fellowship and unity. So Sukkot was established by God as a time to rejoice in the provision of his presence. And it's forever. You shall celebrate it as a feast of the Lord for seven days in the year. It's a statute forever. Throughout your generations, you shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All native Israelites shall dwell in booths, that your generations may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So God revealed that this is a feast his children will celebrate with him in his kingdom throughout all eternity. Therefore, it can be clearly seen and understood that the meaning of this feast is very special to his heart, and this adds to the depth of its power and its purpose. It's a time of emphasizing Torah. And Moses commanded them at the end of every seven years, at the time set in the year of release, at the Feast of Booths, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God at the place that he will choose, you shall read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Now, our biblical English word law is the word Torah in Hebrew. And Torah means instruction. And I've touched on this before. I really wish we translated it that way. I like that nuance because law just sounds kind of cold, kind of empty, kind of like, here, I'm going to see if you're going to do this. But instruction, which is what Torah means, has to do with guidance. And the Lord is taking you somewhere. He's leading you to something. But we can see that God places a special emphasis on his Torah, his instruction, to us after every seventh, which is complete, year during the time of Sukkot. So he particularly chose tabernacles, booze for this. In restoring Sukkot, and all the assembly of those who returned from captivity made booze and lived in the booze from the days of Jeshua, which is his variant spelling of Joshua, the son of Nun, to that day the people of Israel had not done so, and there was very great rejoicing, Nehemiah 8, 17. So the loss of intimacy with God had cost the Jews, their beloved city of Jerusalem, and their national sovereignty. And as God was restoring them to the land, the Jews restored the observance of Sukkot as an act of worship, appreciation, and rejoicing in God for his coming and presence. They had gotten completely away from this. They had gotten away from that intimacy and that purpose of Sukkot. And that lack of intimacy with God is what cost them their land. So that's really key. So when they were being restored to the land, they realized they needed to restore the observance of Sukkot, booze, tabernacles. And there's a prophecy in Zechariah 14, 8 through 9. On that day, living water shall flow out of Jerusalem, half of them to the eastern sea, which is the Dead Sea, and half of them to the western sea, which is the Mediterranean. It shall continue in summer as in winter, and the Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day, the Lord will be one and his name one. So through Zechariah, God made a profound messianic statement about the coming king. And this would prove to be tied to his feast of booth. We're going to get to that. It's a sign of worship, Zechariah 14, 16 through 17. Then everyone who survives of all the nations that have come against Jerusalem shall go up year after year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts. And to keep the Feast of Booths, and if any of the families of the earth do not go up to Jerusalem and worship the King, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. And that, that, that refers to blessing. Now, keep is chakak, and it literally means to move in a circle, but it means march in a sacred procession, observe a festival, and by implication, it means to be giddy, to celebrate, to dance. So God also spoke through Zechariah that the time will come when all the nations of the world would reveal their hearts toward him through the fact of whether or not they observe the spirit purpose and meaning of the feast of booze or not. You know, again, to, to be giddy, to celebrate, to dance. The bottom line is you reveal your heart toward the Lord by the way you respond to him. And so there'll be a time when everything is going to be revealed and those who love the Lord, it's going to be obvious. And those who don't, it's also going to be obvious. Well, we move into the New Testament in John 7, 2 and 10. Now, the Feast of the Jews, or the Jews' Feast of Booze was at hand. And again, it's the Feast of the Lord, but John is just giving it context for the Gentiles. After his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he, being Yeshua, also went up, not publicly, but in private. And this is very compelling to me. But God is always working his perfect plan among us. However, he's often setting up his next move without our awareness of what he's doing. Now, this is always true, but it's, it's interesting to me that this happened during Sukkot, during booze, tabernacles. 
that Christ was actually present. He was working among them. He was with them, but they didn't know it. And this is a now word for us, because as we all are praying for God's redemption to come, for uh, things to turn, we can know that Christ is already here. God is already here. He's already working. He's working behind the scenes. And at just the right moment, he's going to reveal his work and what he's doing. So that gives us hope. So Yeshua was following his father's guidance and coming to the Feast of Booths behind the scenes. And God was preparing his son to make a major revelation about himself. And fulfilling Moses about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began teaching. So as God had given Moses the command to place special emphasis on the Torah every seventh Sukkot, again, Deuteronomy 31, 10 through 11, Yeshua was now fulfilling this word himself by emerging in the middle of the Feast of Booths and teaching God's Torah, his instruction to his people. Well, the Jews therefore marveled, saying, how is it that this man has learning when he's never studied? So Jesus answered them, my teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. Now, we know that Christ, what they're saying is he didn't go through the rabbinic system. It wasn't that he's never studied the scriptures, but he did not do what they had done. He, that he hadn't gone through the accredited uh, rabbinic process. You know, like, hey, you didn't go to the right seminary. You didn't. What, what, what is this? But since the time he was a boy, Yeshua exhibited an astounding understanding and insight in the Torah of God. And we see that when he was 12 years old, he's blowing their minds. But he revealed that this was because he lived in deep, unbroken intimacy with his Father and Holy Spirit. And he was teaching what he'd been taught by his Heavenly Father, not the religion, doctrines, and opinions of human beings. So Yeshua lived in this constant sukkah, this constant booth with his Father and Holy Spirit, always in the covering of his Father, always in the covering of Holy Spirit. That's what sukkah is about. That's what booze is about. And Yeshua lived it first, and he's showing us how to live it. And he's saying, this is how I get all this. I get it in the tent, if you will. I, I stay with my father. And he teaches me by Holy Spirit. I listen. So I have this understanding of Torah that you don't have. Because I didn't get it from you. I didn't get it from man. didn't get it from seminary. didn't get it from books, doctrines, traditions, anybody else. I got it directly from my father. So understanding always comes and only comes through intimacy. And as with Yeshua, so with us. Just as Christ revealed that his understanding came through unbroken intimacy with Abba by his spirit, so it is for everyone else. The only way anyone is ever able to perceive, receive, understand God's word and purposes is through personal intimacy with him. Now, you can hold to doctrines and teachings and traditions, and you can have religion without the Lord, for sure. And that's what they had. But you cannot have true understanding of his word without intimacy with him. So as it was in the time of Christ, those who live by religious spirits will not be able to grasp or accept what he's saying and doing, and they will end up working against him to their own destruction. Now, what was true then is true now. Again, I'm not a prophet, but I do know this because I can know it through scripture, that when God makes his move, and he will, it will be opposed by religious people because it's going to be new. It's going to be different. It's not going to look like what we've seen before and what we've been able to box up or what we learned in seminary. And so those who have intimacy with the Lord are going to recognize it. Yes, this is different, but this is God. But those who don't have intimacy with the Lord are not going to recognize it. As a matter of fact, they're going to reject it. They're going to work against it. That's exactly what happened to Christ. And then here's the very son of God who comes along with all the religious people opposed him to the point of being murderous about it. Now, those who on the fringes that didn't were all caught up in being a Pharisee and all the religious junk, uh, as messy as their lives were, they were listening to Yeshua. They're like, wow, this is powerful. This is amazing. This is just like the, the story of the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. I mean, there are all sorts of things wrong with that situation. She's a Samaritan. She's a sinful woman. She, there's nothing about her that's likely, but Christ reaches out to her. They have this dialogue. She's drawn in. And she does throw some religion into it, but she was still willing to listen to what he had to say. And the more she listened, the more compelled she became. He gave her a great revelation. Matter of fact, he gave her a personal revelation of what he was later going to give here in just a moment. But as with Yeshua, so it is with us. It's all about intimacy. And that's what Sukkot Tabernacles is all about. It's about intimacy with God. 
And he said, if anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own authority, John 7, 17. Remember, know is gnosko. It means come to know, gain a knowledge of, to perceive or feel, to understand. And it's the word used for intimacy between a husband and a wife. So Yeshua taught that for those who have the desire of heart to do God's will on earth, they're the ones who have the knowledge, the confidence and understanding that he's truly speaking for his father and they will live accordingly. Now, hang on to this. It's very important for us because I fully, fully believe that whatever God does next, Whatever's coming and something is coming, God is the God of justice and he is not going to allow this wickedness just to continue. And so something's coming. I don't know what, don't know how, don't know when, but when it does, it's going to look different than anything we've ever seen. And so we'll be able to trust it if we trust him and if we have intimacy with him and then we'll have a confidence and a peace to know this is radically different, but this is God and I embrace it. On the last day of tabernacles, on this day, the priest descended from the temple through the water gate in the wall to the spring that was the original source of Jerusalem's water called Shiloh, and that means resting by the king's garden, interestingly. And their purpose was to obtain living water. That's moving water. So the only water that could be used as, as holy in, in, in temple um, practice was moving water it couldn't come from a cistern or a well or something that was still uh, the moving water has to do with life so it had to come from like a moving spring so they go down to the Shiloh spring and they would gather this living water this moving water and then they would joyfully bring that water back to the temple for the water ceremony and this is all happening on the last day of tabernacles the high priest would then pour out the water libation from a golden pitcher while the people sang, save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. So that's Psalm 118, 25 through 26. So the, the Jewish people were singing this while the water ceremony was going on. So the priests go down to the Shalomach spring, resting by the king's garden, get the water, the living water, the moving water out of the spring bring it back up to the temple. The high priest takes the golden pitcher and begins to pour the living water out. And while he's doing that, people are singing from Psalm 118. Okay, this is happening on the last day of tabernacles. Now you have context. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So while the high priest was performing the water ceremony and pouring out the libation of living water, and the people were singing, save us, we pray, O Lord, then Christ stands up while this is going on, and he cried out publicly that he is the source of true living water. And then he revealed the spirit of his living water will flow through all who love and desire him, which is the fulfillment of the prophecies. So at the right moment, the precise moment that the people are focused on this and all this is happening and living water is being poured out, it was then that Yeshua stood up and cried out publicly, I am he. And more so, all who have intimacy with me, living water will flow through you as well. Now, in Amos 9-11, uh, he has a prophecy about a special sukkah, a special booth, a tabernacle. In that day, I will raise up the booth of David that has fallen and repair its breaches and raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old. Now, booth, again, is sukkah. Sukkot, tabernacles, is the plural of that. Sukkah is the, <coughs> excuse me, um, the singular. Interestingly, it's a feminine noun. And that's a place of receiving. The feminine spirit is a receiving spirit. And so we have a booth, a pavilion, a tabernacle, or a tent. David's tabernacle is special. It's unique. Now, the Bible doesn't give us a description, direct description of it. But you'll remember, David uh, had a special tent built for the Ark of the Covenant as it was brought into Jerusalem. It was not the wilderness tabernacle. It was not that. And it was not the temple yet. So it was a unique tent. Well, extra biblical sources and tradition tells us 
that David's tent had no sides to it. And so the people could actually see the Ark of the Covenant in the tent. That's unique. That was not true in the wilderness tabernacle, not true in the temple. But during the time of David, and David, there's never been a greater worshiper of the Lord. He wasn't perfect, but there's never been a heart that has been surpassed in worship for God. So during David's time, because he had such a heart for worship, and remember, he commanded that the priests and, and those who were in, in uh, service of the Lord were to have 24-7 worship. So they were satisfying the, the veil, if you will. Their worship, their surrounding that open-sided tent provided the necessary environment for the Shekinah of God to rest there. But what was special about it is that the people, from a distance, they couldn't come up to it, but from a distance, they could actually see the Shekinah glory of God resting on the ark. That was unique to the time of David. After David was gone, that went away. The, the ark was covered once again. The people didn't see it, only the high priest and only once a year. So that's a profound time uh, of worship among the people of God. And that's why Amos is saying, he's pointing to the sukkah, the tent of David, this unique tent in this unique time for the people of God. Now we see in Acts 15, 16, after this, I will return and rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it. Now, this is James quoting Amos regarding the restoration of unhindered worship. And that's the heart of David's sukkah for God. That's what that's all about. And the great inclusion of all Gentiles who desire to know God personally and intimately. So, again, a very special sukkah. So when God talks about tabernacles and he's saying this is the seventh feast and this is the, really the most important because it fulfills all the others, it gives them their meaning. And then he speaks of, he gives a prophecy of a special booth, a special tabernacle, special sukkah. That's the tabernacle of David. And James is bringing it forward saying in Christ by Holy Spirit, this is what's going to be restored to the earth. Now, it certainly was in part in the first century as Holy Spirit was poured out on the people of God. Jew and Gentile, but there's been a diminishing of that. So we can know that there's still a greater outpouring that's coming and a greater worship, an unhindered worship among the people of God that's going to be transformative as we get credit prepared for the ultimate return of the king himself. The tabernacle's forever fulfilled. And we can see in Revelation 21.3, and this is the Passion Translation. I heard a thunderous voice from the throne saying, look, God's tabernacle is with human beings. And from now on, he will tabernacle with them as their God. Now God himself will have his home with them. God with them. Emmanuel will be their God. The complete Jewish Bible renders it this way. I heard a loud voice from the throne say, see God's Shekinah is with mankind. And he will live with them. They will be his people. And he himself, God with them, will be their God. So this verse represents the apex of the revelation given to John. And God personally coming to make his eternal tabernacle dwelling with and among his people. His people in the fullness of his Shekinah glory. Everything else that is eternal springs from this truth and this reality. This is the whole point, isn't it? This is what was lost in the Garden of Eden, that intimacy with God, Adam and Eve dwelling with him personally, face to face, walking with him, worshiping him, loving him, hearing him, talking to him. That's what it's all about. That was lost through our choices, through our sin. Christ came, obviously, to pay the price for that. But why? So that this could occur, the restoration of intimacy. That's what Sukkot is all about. Abba Father in Yeshua's name and your Holy Spirit we thank you so much for your living word to us it is a now word and Lord as we are in this time of Sukkot tabernacles booths Lord we redouble our focus on you we thank you we join with the people of God in celebrating the meaning of this week it's all about intimacy with you it's all about love it's all about adoration and you're covering your presence with us and we thank you for this. And Father, we know that regardless of what goes on in this still fallen world, that in the spirit, we are covered by you. And your glory lives within us. And we have access to your most holy place, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 
365 and one quarter days a year. Lord, there's never a time when we don't have access to you. And we thank you for this. But Father, there's something more because ultimately you desire for your manifest presence, your client kind of glory to dwell with us, among us, forever on the earth. And that's ultimately what's coming. And so that's the meaning of this tabernacle's week. So Holy Spirit, we ask that you continually remind us uh, of what this week means. And may we be intentional to focus upon that. Now, Lord, I, I readily say I'm no prophet, but I know that there's something special about this particular tabernacle. And so, Lord, we just continue to focus on you. We know that just as you went incognito to that tabernacle so long ago, you were there. The people didn't know it. So it is now. You're here. You're working among us. You're, you're setting up your move. You're not going to allow wickedness to prevail. Yeshua has already won. He has accomplished the victory on the cross through his death, burial, and resurrection. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. All authority has been given to him in heaven and on earth. And we dwell in that authority with him. So, Father, we thank you for this. And, Lord, if, if we leave here today without hope in our hearts, without joy, we're not listening to you. We haven't been hearing what you're saying. So, Father, we receive encouragement today. We receive strength today. We receive hope today. We reject the lies of the enemy. We reject the schemes of the enemy. They're already defeated. They're working in vain. It's vanity. It will come to nothing. Yeshua, this earth belongs to you. Abba has promised it to you as your inheritance. And if for no other reason, Father, you would move just for Yeshua's sake. But we know that you're also moving for us. And we thank you for that. So, Lord, we love you, we praise you, we celebrate tabernacles in our hearts and minds this week. It's in Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Grace and peace to you.